First, I would like to thank the organizers for the invitation to speak about my reminiscences of Fezai Gursay on the occasion of the 100th anniversary of his birth year. I have way too many memories to be able to cover in 15 minutes, so I will be very selective. I should also mention that some of what I'm going to say will be a repeat of what I said at a meeting organized by Franco Iacchello at Yale University in memory of Sua Gursay on April 13, 2010, shortly after she passed away. Maybe I should begin by telling you how I first met Feza and Sua for the first time in 1967. At the time I was doing my undergraduate studies at Robert College in Istanbul. During the spring of my junior year, I made a trip with a friend Haluk Aytaç to Ankara to consult with Feza Girse about graduate schools to which I was planning to apply. Feza was teaching at Middle East Technical University at the time. We appeared in Feza's office completely unannounced. Feza was very gracious and generous with his time in talking to us. I told Feza that I was hoping to work on quantum gravity for my PhD. He recommended Bryce David as the physicist to work with if that was my goal at the time. After talking to us, Feza invited us to join him, Suanam, and their group for lunch. It's at that lunch that I met Suanam for the first time. At lunch, there were students as well as some young instructors present. I was struck by the warm, close-knit family atmosphere between Sua, Feza, and the young people around them. Both Sua and Feza were clearly enjoying the company of the young people around them. During the same trip, I also got to meet the mathematician Jaitar. When I asked Jaitar what he was working on at the time, he said his work was in the area of class field theory. While explaining his work, he pivoted and talked about the work of a young, ambitious Canadian mathematician in the office next to his. This was Robert Langland, whom I met several years later at Yale. Of the universities I got accepted for graduate study, Yale appealed to me the most, so I decided to do my graduate studies at Yale. Feza and Sohar were in Turkey during my first year at Yale. They came back to Yale at the end of that year. Towards the end of my second year, Itzhak Bars was already working with Feza, brought word to me that Feza would like to have me as one of his PhD students. It was an honor and opportunity I could not pass up. So I joined the family. Just as Feza became my doctor father, so I became my doctor mother. As I gave me the Kerr Shield metric to study as a thesis project initially. I started working on it, and I also volunteered to write up the lecture notes of the course of teaching on the unitary representations of the space-time groups during the spring of 1971. At the beginning of the course, Feza summarized all the simple Lie groups. He explained that there exist three infinite families of Lie groups that arise as symmetries of vector spaces over the real numbers, complex numbers, and quaternions. He said that he had heard from Freeman Dyson that the Russian mathematician named Rosenfeld had shown the connection between the five exceptional Lie groups and octonians. I was very intrigued by the fact that there are only five groups related to octonians, while there are infinitely many related to the other division algebras. On a sunny but bitter cold day, Winter day, I walked over to the math department to talk to Professor Nathan Jacobs. I told him that I heard from Professor Gursay, who had heard from Freeman Dyson that a Russian mathematician named Rosenfeld had shown the connection between you know, exceptional Lie groups and octonians. I wanted to know if he could guide me to the literature on the subject. Nathan Jacobson smiled broadly and said, to my knowledge, Russians have not done all that much on this subject, but I can give you all the relevant references on the subject. I did not know that Jacobson was the world's leading authority on exceptional Lie algebras and non-associative algebras when I walked into his office.
One of the references Jacobson gave me was the paper of Rodenthal titled Lee Groups in the Foundations of Geometry. Feza and I started studying this paper. This paper reviewed the famous magic square of Freudenthal, Rosenfeld, and Pitts that contained four of the exceptional groups on its last row and last column and the associated remarkable geometries. Most striking thing about the magic square from the physics point of view was the fact that practically all the groups in the magic square, except for the exceptional groups, had already appeared in particle physics as symmetry groups. Furthermore, the fifth exceptional group, G2, is the automorphism group of octonians and has the SU3 symmetry as a subgroup. These facts beg the question what role, if any, exceptional groups and octonians could play in particle physics. I told Feza that I would like to work on the question of what possible role exceptional groups and octonians could play in particle physics for my thesis. I also told him that I could always go back and finish the work on Kirchhoff metric later. Feza expressed his concern that it was too risky for a graduate student to work on such a speculative project in uncharted territory for his or her own thesis. Furthermore, he added that American physics establishment does not appreciate very mathematical formalisms that I might not be able to get a job in the US. I told him that I was willing to take the risk and that I would apply for jobs in Europe where mathematical physics was better appreciated at the time. I should perhaps add that this was a pre-written era in theoretical physics. The landscape of theoretical physics looked very different at that time. Feza reluctantly agreed to let me work on octonians and exceptional groups and their possible applications to physics for my thesis. Fortunately for me, Jacobson taught a course on exceptional algebra the following semester, which I attended with utmost interest. I discussed whatever I learned in Jacobson's course with Feza about its potential relevance to physics. It was during that time, one day, when Feza and I were walking from Klein Tower towards Gibbs Lab on Yale campus, Feza suddenly stopped and said, Murat, I would like to give you two pieces of advice that Wolfgang Pauli gave me. Pauli said that you should never publish a paper if you know you can write a better version of it. And furthermore, you should never publish a paper if you know that someone else can write the same paper. Feza then added, I know following these two pieces of advice would make your career more difficult, but that was the advice given to me by Pauli. During my last year of graduate study at Yale, Feza and Sua were at Middle East Technical University in Ankara. Before they left for Turkey, they asked me if my wife Rita and I would like to stay in their apartment during that year. Of course, we were happy to take up their offer. Their son Yusuf was going to be a freshman at Yale that year. Yusuf stayed in a dorm on Yale campus and would come home over the weekends and holidays. <clears throat> it was the first time Feza and so I were going to be far away from Yusuf for an extended period of time. <clears throat> so I later told me that on their way to JFK airport from New Haven to fly to Turkey, Feza broke down in tears in the limousine. Feza also asked me, sorry, <clears throat> to forward all the private mail that year to Turkey. And as for the physics preprints he might receive, he asked me to forward only those preprints that looked interesting. Among the preprints that arrived that year was a paper of Mary Gelman in which he was proposing the color quark scheme for the first time. I got very excited when I saw that paper and wrote to Feza about it and forwarded the preprint to him. In that paper, Gelman proposed a scheme in which color quarks were not observable and the quark fields operated on a fictitious Hilbert space and only the color single states in that Hilbert space 
were observable. The paper of Gelman provided one of the main motivations for my paper with Feza on octonionic color quark scheme. We could give a mathematical model of Gelman's proposal in which transfers octonionic quark fields act on an octonionic state space, and only the color singlet complex subspace corresponds to observables. Peter Franz referred to the resulting statistics as GG statistics. However, our scheme was purely kinematical and did not have any dynamics. Shortly afterwards, experiments showed that quarks are not unobservable, but rather they are confined permanently in hadrons, and QCD was developed as the correct dynamical theory of strong interactions. For my first postdoctoral positions, I applied only to European institutions and got two offers, both from Italy, ICTP in Trieste and Scuola Normale in Pisa. I chose to go to Scuola Normale. The following summer, Feza and so I visited Scuola Normale and Feza gave a talk in a workshop organized by Radicati there and we continued our collaboration. One weekend during their stay in Pisa, Feza, Sua, my wife Rita and I went on a tour of Tuscany with the final destination, Siena. Feza was our guide. Even though he had never been to Siena before, as I gave us a tour of Siena, and in particular the cathedral, like a professional guide explaining the importance of the various works of art from a broad historical and cultural perspective with great enthusiasm. It was a real treat. At the time, Feza and I started our investigations at Yale on octonians and exception groups. There were only three flavors of quarks known, and Etut had not yet shown the normalizability of weinberg salam model. After Etut's work and development of QCD and discovery of Chamkov, the frontier in particle physics moved to grand unified theories. Feza, together with Ramon and Skivi, Skivi proposed the gut based on the exception group B6, and with, with Skivi, they got based on the exception group B7. Later with Isaac Bas, I proposed with, with, with sorry, there is something that says host has published your video for everyone. Sorry. Okay. Later, Isaac Bars and I proposed the gut based on the largest exceptional group E8. Again in the 70s, non-compact split exceptional groups of the E series were shown to arise as symmetries of the maximal supergravity theory in various dimensions by Julien and Kramer. As I was quite excited about the appearance of exceptional groups in maximum supergravity. As I talked about some of his work on grand unified theories at the Einstein Centennial Symposium in Jerusalem in March 1979, which I also attended. One afternoon during the symposium, Feza, Sua, Mary Gelman, and I went on a walking tour of the old city in Jerusalem, and in particular along Via Dolorosa. Feza and Murray were our guides, competing with each other in providing information about the historical sites along the way and what transpired there two millennia ago. Both Suan and I were thrilled by the guidance provided by Feza and Murray. One place Feza wanted to visit very much was the Dome of the Rock, which was unfortunately closed, during, closed to visitors during the symposium Due to some incidences there. On the last day of our day stay in Jerusalem, we heard that the Dome of the Rock was open to visitors again. We rushed to visit the site. We first visited the Al Aqsa Mosque and then went over to see the Dome of the Rock, in particular the Ottoman tiles around it that Feza had heard so much about from his mother. Again, as I was our guide and commented in particular on the history of the Ottoman tiles which were magnificent. After my postdoctoral stay in Italy, I went to the University of Bonn. During my tenure at the University of Bonn, I visited Yale numerous, numerous times. Feza and Sua also visited Bonn during that period, and Feza gave a talk on quaternion and autistic in a workshop we organized there. 
both during my graduate years as well as my subsequent visits to Yale, Rita and I were invited to dinner by Feza and Sua countless number of times, where we enjoyed greatly the company and those of the other guests, as well as Sua's fabulous cooking. Their hospitality was exceptional even by Turkish standards. After my tenure at the University of Bonn, I went to CERN and from there to Ecole Normale Superior in Paris. Feza attended the yearly summer institute at Ecole Normale during my stay there in 1983. Before his arrival, I had just completed my work with Sierra and Thompson on Maxwell Einstein's supergravity theories and showed the existence of four remarkable supergravity theories. They were the unique, unified, Maxwell Einstein's supergravity theories with symmetric scalar manifolds and their symmetric groups in various dimensions correspond to the symmetric groups that appear in the famous magic square of Ford and Tal Rosenfeld and Titz. Hence, we call them magical supergravity theories. As I expected, Feza was very excited to hear about our results and he congratulated me. Discovery of the magical supergravity theories represented a high point in my research. Their study and extensions have played a major part of my research activity ever since. From Ecole Normale, I went to Caltech and from there to Berkeley, where our daughter was born. Rita and I will never forget the beautiful basket of flowers delivered to our home in Moraga, sent by Feza and Sua, the day after our daughter was born. We were very much touched by their gesture and Rita was moved to tears. Last time I saw Feza before he passed away was during his homecoming conference at Edirne, organized by Mehmet Koji and others. Unfortunately, his plans to return to Turkey after his retirement from Yale were dashed by his illness. I was on sabbatical leave at the Institute for Advanced Study at Princeton the year after Feza passed away. Sua came to visit us at the Institute. I had never seen Sua as emotional as she was during that visit. We took walks around the Institute grounds and Sua reminisced about their time at the Institute and the friends they had made. She showed us the Institute apartment where they had lived. During that visit, we were invited to a gathering at Arthur Whiteman's home. Feza's friends and colleagues who were present at that gathering expressed their condolences to Suha and reminisced about Feza. Again, during that visit, we ran into Robert Langland in Princeton. Suha was happy to see him and talk to him for quite a while. Later, she told me that Feza had a special place in his heart for Robert Langland. It has been exactly 50 years since Feza and I began our investigations into the role of Tony and an exceptional Gusmave may play in physics. Exceptional groups and alternatives have since appeared in many areas of theoretical physics, in particular, grand unified theories, supergravity theories, M-theory and superstring theory, and even in cosmology. Unfortunately, Feza did not live long enough to see some of these developments and contribute to them. Feza left an indelible impression on the people who met him and got to know him. As John Sachlow once put it, Feza walked around with a halo around him. He was an exceptional human being, a great scientist, and one of the finest examples of scholarly gentleman physicists of the old world. I was most fortunate to have had him as my advisor, my mentor, and the role model to emulate. He had a deep influence on my style of physics. I will always cherish his memory and that of Swanam dearly. Thank you.